be seated. And I've done the best I can.
God a hand clap of praise sometime, church. It's all right to give God a hand clap of praise, church. It's all right to give God a hand clap of praise, church. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right to give God a hand clap of praise. Beloved, you've been so attentive. You've been so kind. You've been so wonderful as we have traveled through 1 John 4 through what we've termed the Love Chronicles, the Love Chronicles. And here we are on the fourth Sunday of February and we're at the end of this journey and I think as you'll see by the end there's never really an end to this journey. Um, for the reading of God's word we'll be coming from 1 John 4 verse 19 through 5 5. 1 John 4 19 through 5 5. We'll be led in a reading of God's word by Reverend Bailey. Let us please rise honoring God's holy word. Let us rise for the reading of God's holy word. 1 John 4, 19 through 5, 5. Amen. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this man have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. Who, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begot love also have begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the world that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Amen. Amen, beloved. So ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Dear Lord, dear Father, we have come before you, and songs of praise have been sung. We have come before you, dear God, and prayers have been lifted up. We've come before you, dear God, and praise has been given. We have come before you, Lord, and petitions with supplication have gone out. We've come before you, Lord, and the, the victories, the achievements, and the, the rewards of such have been, been recognized, dear God. But now we come. Now we come to the time of the preaching of your holy word. Dear God, for the lost, perhaps it will be light. For the saved, perhaps it will be encouragement. For all. I pray it shall be received. Let us receive it, dear Father, in a way that we can give you praise, give you honor, and give you glory. Use me now, dear Father, as I'm cloaked in this robe. Cloak me, dear Father, in your spirit. Let your anointing flow from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. And while they may look at me as the man standing here speaking the word, let them know I speak not my word, but the word given unto me to give to them from you. Bless us in this time. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 Beloved, have you had a good time in the Lord already? Yes. Have you been blessed thus far in this worship service already? Yes. Well, prayerfully as the word goes forth, nothing will come that will frustrate that. So, so here we are at the end of the Love Chronicles. The Love Chronicles. We've learned about loving God the Son. We've learned about loving God the Father. We've learned about loving God the Holy Spirit. But our love for God is actually a sterile love. 
A love for God is a stoic love. A love for God is a distant love, an impotent love, unless it is a love that does something else. A love that impacts somebody else. Your love is not love if it doesn't do something to and for somebody else. The love chronicles will be incomplete if it only dealt with our love of God, but we want it to be complete. So it has to include others. The title of today's message is The Love Chronicles. Love each other. Love each other. All right, Zion. We got visitors in here. Don't y'all act like visitors. You know, what, you know what time it is. You know what time it is. So don't sit here looking at me like, what is he talking about? Get your bulletins. Turn to the back. Turn to the back. Turn to the back. Now, some of you all should know this by now. But just in case you need to refresh yourself. Are we ready? Because this is the fourth time we should be ready. Let's show our visitors that Zion knows how to do it right. Amen. Are we ready? Beloved, let us love one another. Stop. That's not quite right. As I said to you all before, this is not a funeral procession. This is a living church, and this is the living word of God. You need to sing it like it is. Amen. So let's see if we can pick up the pace a wee little bit on this. All right. Amen. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Beloved, for us to expect to receive love, we must also be willing to give love. And love is an emotion and also an action that demands reciprocity. That means you give and you receive. If you're not receiving, it's probably because you're really not giving. What do I mean? I mean that I knew that I loved my wife the moment that I laid eyes on her. I knew that thing. When I laid eyes on her, I was just 16 years old. And it was not puppy love. It wasn't infatuation. It was an epiphany. This is the woman who I'm going to marry. Now, God gave me that revelation. But God did not give her that revelation at the same time. <laughs> it didn't all happen quite at the same time. You see, I, I loved her and I had to wait for her to realize that in God's wisdom and, and in God's timing that I was the one who she should also love. Thank you, God. And in time, she came to give me the love that I was giving her. And the rest is history or in deference to God. The rest is his story. Amen. 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 My wife loved me because I chose to love her without any confirmation that she would love me back. And this is what happens when you understand what love really is. Some of us don't want to do unless somebody else does. That's not the way that we should live our lives because that's not what God does with us. Remember what 1 John 4 19 tells us. We love him because he first loved us. You don't love God because you chose to love God. You love God because he first loved you. What do I mean by that? Beloved, God loved us when he created this world out of nothing. God loved us when he placed everything in this world that we would ever need. God loved us when he created men and women in his own image. Amen. God loved us when he sent out our sinful foreparents, Adam and Eve, from the Garden of Eden to discipline them and to protect them from knowledge and eternity that they were not prepared to receive. God loved us when he destroyed the earth and life with a great flood, as the word tells. And God loved us when through Noah and his family he chose to create all over again. And God 
loved us when God stepped out of heaven in the form of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, planted in the womb of Mother Mary so that God could walk incarnate upon this earth. And God loved us when Jesus went to the cross and he died for our sins. And God loved us when Jesus rose in three days, walked this earth for 40 days, and then ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for every single one of your sins. Anybody need to say thank you for something right now that they've been doing wrong to God right now? And say, God, thank you for forgiving me for my sins. Amen. And beloved, and God loved us when after he arose, he promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to dwell inside any one of us who would dare to believe in him on his name. And God loved us when through salvation, when we accept him, the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside each and every one of us. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You see, beloved, the whole Holy Bible story is nothing if it's not a love story about how much God loves us, whether we deserve it or not. And for all of this love that God has poured out selflessly, generously to us and on us, we ought to also love God. We ought to love God back. So as God's love is unquestioned, the question that remains is, do we love God? Do we love God? And the question beyond that is also how do we know that we love God? You see, is love for God found in our songs? You see, some of you have been singing, but that can just be entertainment to pass the time. Is our love for God found in our praise? That can be uplifting, but it is not where our love is found. Is our love for God found in our worship? That can be very gratifying, but that may not be where love is actually found. Is our love found in our sacrifice of our time, our talent, and our treasure? You came around, you gave your tithes, you gave your offerings, you gave your donations. Maybe you say, I prove that I love God, but is that where God's love is actually found? Or is God's love found somewhere else? You see, 1 John 4 and 20 says, if a man say, I love God, I love God and hateth his brother. The word says he's a liar. The word says he's a liar. That means for somebody to say that they love God, but then turn around and say they hate you, that's a liar. You don't love me, so you, you, you can't really love God. It says, for he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? How is that possible? To paraphrase John's words, if you love God, then how can you also at the same time, simultaneously, congruently, in parallel fashion, hate those who God loves? How is that possible for you to have the duality in your mind to hate and love at the same time? And still say that you love God. If God is love and God's love is pervasive, expansive, powerful, and impactful, then your love, if it is truly love, like God's love, your love should be the same as God's love. You see, beloved, the love of God, God's love is powerful. God's love is vibrant. And God's love is authoritative. Basically, God's love changes things. God's love changes things. And since God is love, when you dare, and I say it's a dare, when you dare to love as God loves, then your love should change things too. You see, some of you are playing like, like, like Groundhog Day, the movie where you wake up and every day is the same old day. Something's wrong with that. As I said to you, if there's nothing new birthing and happening in your life, then where's the revelation of God in your life? Because God is the same, but God don't keep things the same. God keeps on birthing. God keeps on blooming. God keeps on revealing. So if that's not happening in your life, child of God, then if you left God, it was God left you. But where is your love and what does your love do? Child of God. You see, when your love is minimal, when your love is divisive, when your love is selfish and self-centered, then your love, if you want to call it love, does not reflect, magnify, or glorify the love of God in your life. Therefore, what you may call love is not love at all. But how do you know? How do you know? 1 John 4 and 21 answers, And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. He who loveth God, love his brother also. If you love your brother or sister, then they should be lifted up when they are fallen down. Lifted up by you. 
If you love your brother or your sister, they should be encouraged when they feel downtrodden. All because of you, they should be encouraged by you. If you love your brother or your sister, they should be hopeful when feeling despair because they're getting hope because you speak words of life and lifting and love into their lives. If you love your brother or your sister, you should somehow be making their lives better on their way to being the best it can possibly be. If you love your brother or your sister, that's what should be happening. And God expects nothing less for in Matthew 22 verses 37 through 39, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what? With all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. That's what the word says. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Perhaps that's part of the problem. Perhaps that's part of the problem. I should be less concerned about how you love me. I should be more concerned about how do you love you? How do you love you? You see, beloved, if you've received the love of God, then I hope and pray that you know enough about God to know that you are worth being loved. Some folks don't know that about themselves. You're worth being loved. That means you are highly valued. That means you are cherished. That means you are esteemed. That means you are highly favored. That means you are prized. That means you are treasured. That means you are highly regarded by God. If nobody else told you, basically, you are extraordinarily, fortunately, undeniably loved by God, which should make you, Zion, zealous, mighty, marvelous, bold, and courageous, so that you can love others as you have been loved by God. As you've been loved by God. The love from God and the love of God should lead to a love for God that's reflected in how you treat other people, because love is an action word. Love is an action word. I know it is sometimes hard to receive what you do not deserve because we don't deserve the love of God. Nobody in here does and nobody in here ever will. We don't deserve the love of God. But child of God, you can never be all that you're supposed to be in God or for God until you truly receive the love of God. In essence, God already has in mind who you are supposed to be. But until you begin to see yourself through the lens of God's love, you never will be. All that God desires for you to be. So, beloved, how can you receive this love of God? 1 John 5 and 1 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Beloved, for you to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the promised Messiah, our Savior and Lord, you must be born again. Is that not what Jesus told Nicodemus? You got to be born again. And when you are born again, you are born of God making you a son or a daughter of God. Touch your neighbor right now and say, neighbor, if you were saved, then you are a son or a daughter of God. And in the loving family of God, you should love the one. God, who has given you new life, while also loving those around you who have also received the new life from God. You should be loving each other that way. But it first begins with a belief that by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, God the Son, Jesus, was born of a virgin Mary to become the only begotten Son of God the Father. Our whole faith is based on this simple belief. I don't care where you go, what they teach, what they preach. If they don't teach that, it's a cult and not a church. Because it all depends on you believing that one truth. You have to believe that. And if you believe this, then you are a son or a daughter of God. The God who is loved only bears those who are like him. Therefore, if you are like God, you should be loving as God. Is loving. Amen. So as God is love, your love for one another proves that you too are of your heavenly Father, God the Father. And his love also dwells inside of you. For 1 John 5, 2 and 3 tells us, by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments. When we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. 
Beloved, the children of God learn that they have to trust God and learn that they got to obey God. Now, you may say, that sounds hard. How many of you in your house and raising your children want to make sure your children trust you and that they obey you? If they won't trust you, they won't believe nothing that you say. If they don't obey you, they won't do nothing that you tell them to do. And then you ain't going to have heaven in your house. But you'll have a whole lot of, we got children in the house. <laughs> you see, beloved, if we love God, then we must learn to follow God first and foremost in our lives. I wonder if you were completely honest, you made a list of the priority in your life. Would God be first? Or would family be first? You see, your family can be jacked up. And you place them above God and wonder why things ain't working out right in your life. Your friends can be messed up. And you want to spend time with your friends, but you don't want to spend time with God. And you wonder why things don't seem to work out. Your job might sound like you got a good title, but all the mess you have to go through on it may sometimes make you wonder. Do you want to get up on Monday morning and go back? But when you say that title, people say, oh, that sounds like a really good job. And you sound like a really important person. And if you don't place God first in your life, you won't be able to navigate that wilderness journey very well. You see, if you don't place God first, something is wrong in your life. Nothing else will do. You see, um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I know Elder knows the song by LaShawn Pace very well. Is your all on the altar? And a lot of us think, oh, LaShawn Pace, she's saying that song. No, LaShawn Pace sang Elisha Hoffman's song. A Presbyterian minister who wrote this song back in 1900. So it's been a long time that people have been saying, you have longed for sweet peace. And for faith to increase. And have earnestly and fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar a sacrifice laid? Are you picking up your trash, taking it to the dumpster, and then taking it right back with you? With the stench of it. With the ugliness of it. With the, frankly, it ain't no good for you no more of it back with you when you say you're going to lay it down at the altar. When we bring you the altar call, are you laying something down or you're just shuffling down? Is something in your life changing or are you just going through the motions of staying the same? Does God somehow touch your spirit and move you in a way that you know that God's working and moving inside of you and changing your life for the better? Oh, it's just another day. You see, I learned a long time ago, I don't want to have any kind of day with God because God makes every day special for me. God makes every day an opportunity for me. God brings light in every day for me. Therefore, when somebody wants to speak the worst, I don't look at the problems. I start expecting God to bring me some solutions into my life. You don't have to live that way, but I can promise you your life will be better if you did. You see, beloved, You've got to yield, as Elisha Hoffman said. You've got to yield him your body and your soul. You've got to yield him your body and your soul. And in yielding to God's love and God's commandments, you will find the truth in Jesus' words in Matthew 11, 28 and 30. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor. Is anybody in here laboring? Is anybody in here laboring? Does anybody want to be honest that life is not all they believe that it was going to be? That life is not all they believe that it should be? That life is not all their hope is ever going to be? Does anybody want to be honest? Is some of you out there laboring? Are some of you out there heavy laden? You're being held down by some stuff going on in your health right now. You really know you got to make that doctor's appointment, but you don't really want to go. Because you don't want to hear what they got to say. Are some of you out there saying right now, yes, I know at 9 o'clock I'm supposed to be on that job, but I'm sick of going to that place. I'm tired of dealing with them people. I know we got a couple of graduating seniors out here right now. They're probably like, I don't want to have to write another paper. I don't want to have to take another exam. I'm so ready to say, see ya. <laughs> but I can promise you when you walk across that stage, you will just have to walk into an opportunity to work even harder. Because that's the way life happens to be. Every promotion don't mean that it's going to get easier in your life. 
Promotion means God is preparing you to do more and prayerfully better work in your life. That's what you should be striving for. You see, but when you try and do it on your own, you're going to be limited. So when he says, come ye, come to me all that you labor, you that labor, and I have it laid. And he says, I'm going to do something for you. I will give you rest. I don't even need a show of hands here, but I can look out and see some of y'all didn't get a good night's sleep last night. Some of y'all been tossing and turning throughout the night. Some of y'all was probably hoping maybe I won't even open my eyes on Sunday morning so I can get away from all that I'm going through, what I'm dealing with. You didn't have any rest. All you had was a night of slumber, but you were probably up and down more than you could close your eyes and get that good deep sleep. That we're supposed to need to keep us sane. Some of the folks in your life you deal with act like they done lost their mind. They have. <laughs> because they don't sleep. They have no rest. And when you don't rest, you will lose your mind. You will lose your mind. But he says, I will give you rest. But how? He says, take my yoke. Take my yoke. Take my yoke upon you. And learn of me. And as we discussed in Hope Wednesday, the yoke that he says to take upon you, the yoke is twofold. With a yoke is made for two oxen, one on one side and one on the other side. And it's made that way because sometimes both are equally strong, but other times one is strong and the other's weak. And when the weak gets weak, the strong pulls them through. And there's nobody as strong in your life as King Jesus. So when you start going through, if you've been yoked to Jesus, you're going to do what you didn't think you could do. You're going to make it through stuff they said you couldn't make it through. You're going to accomplish things. They said, little black boy, little black girl, from where you from, who you are, you can't do, you won't do, you won't be able to, and God will pull you through. And as God begins to pull you through, I pray that you will no longer allow yourself to see yourself the same way. Because his word says, take my yoke upon you. And then he says, and learn of me. You see, some of us go to God like he's a genie in a lamp. We don't really know nothing about God and what his holy word says. But all we know is, well, mama said, pray. Grandmama said, pray. Well, mama and grandma didn't tell you if you literate not to read your holy word and learn what the word of God says about you and your life because God has more for you than just pray. He says, learn of me. Learn of me. And what you learn about Jesus, he says, I am meek and I am lowly in heart and there you will find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy. My yoke is easy. That means When can't nobody else pull you through, I'll pull you through. When mama gone, I'm there. When daddy gone, I'm there. When husband gone, I'm there. When wife is gone, I'm there. When your boo thing is gone, God is going to be there. He will bring you through. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You see, beloved, in resting in Jesus, we're going to find we got peace. Anybody need peace? Somebody say, I need peace. Somebody say, I, we, 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 I need peace. Somebody say, I need peace. And when we, we rest in Jesus, we'll find that we have joy. Somebody say, I need joy. And when we rest in Jesus, we'll find that we have power. Somebody say, I need power. I say, I need power. I need power. Well, you sound like you some here, I guess. Well, let me see what we can do about that wanting of your power. For 1 John 5, 4 and 5 encourages us, for whatsoever is born of God. Who said they need power in there? Let me just see, see hands. Let me see hands. Let me see hands. Let me see hands. See, some of y'all must not want no power. Cool. We'll just let everybody else get your power. And you'll be sitting there watching them. You'll be clapping for them and they power. You'll be sitting there with no power. You see, he says, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Overcometh the world. Overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Our faith. Our faith. You got to believe in stuff you can't even see when it comes to God. You got to start speaking some things into existence. You 
you got to start trusting in some stuff where people say there's nothing there. You got to start going to the edge of something and trusting and believing. There's a step for you to go down. And then because you took that step, you got to trust God to take another step. And because God helped you with that, so you got to take another step. And then 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 you gonna stop. And you gonna look back. Or you gonna say, look where he brought me from. Beloved, I was born on 127 North Cameron Avenue. And some of y'all hear this, you may laugh, you may smile, you may think it's a joke. I was born on 127 North Cameron Avenue. A good life would have been me finishing high school and going to work in the factories. But God took me literally around the world. From 127 North Cameron Avenue, God took me to a little place, Atlanta, Georgia, and helped me get a couple of degrees from Morehouse College in Georgia Tech. From 127 North Cameron Avenue, God took me to Boston, Massachusetts to go get an MBA from Harvard University. From 127 North Cameron Avenue, God then took me to New York City and Geneva, Switzerland. From 127 North Cameron Avenue, God then brought me back to Durham, North Carolina. Then God took me back to Atlanta, Georgia. Then God brought me back all from 127 North Cameron Avenue. And then God said, you going back to get you some more education. And so then I went to Hood Theological Seminary to get my Master of Divinity degree. All from 127 North Cameron Avenue. And then God said, you keep on going a little further because now I done put you in charge of this church, leading this church over here on 101 North Dunlap Avenue. All from 127 North Cameron Avenue. And so he said, now what we're going to do is we're going to go to Duke University and go pursue a Doctor of Ministry degree at Duke Divinity School. That wasn't supposed to happen from 127 North Cameron Avenue. But look where he done brought me from. And I say that to say, I am not special. But I am unique. Because God made each one of us unique. We're not special, but we're all made by God. We're all God's children. And so limitation should be a word that you can spell. It should be a word you can define, but it's not a word you should apply. You should continue trusting and believing that if God will bring you to something, God has not birthed a dream in your head to give you frustration. The word of God says that my young men shall dream dreams and my old men will have vision. Do you have dreams and visions that you've not accomplished as of yet? Take it to God in prayer and see what God has to say about it. See what God will do with it. If you will trust in God that way. If you will trust in God that way. If you will trust in God that way. You see, beloved, Jesus was born of God and Jesus overcame the world. And he said of himself, sometimes you got to talk about yourself. As other folks talk about you, sometimes you got to speak your own truth about yourself. Sometimes you can't let people just talk about because they may get it wrong. They may get it twisted. They may tell a story not quite right. You see, Jesus said of himself in John 16 and 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me he might have peace. Now, truth is, Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation. Anybody, I see some heads nodding right now. Anybody know what I mean? You're going to go through some stuff in life, amen. You're going to go through some stuff in life. He says, but in the midst of tribulation, what do, what do most people do? They get dragged down by what's dragging them down. But Jesus had the audacity that only Jesus could do. Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. 
be of good cheer. That's why I'm telling the Coleman family, I'm telling the Mac family, when y'all go and see Wayne, tell him don't be worried about that leg that ain't moving right now. Tell him God going to move that leg. And until God says he ain't going to move that leg, we're going to keep believing, we're going to keep praying, we're going to keep laying hands until God moves that leg. And we're going to be happy while he's going through. Because we're going to trust that God has greater and more in store for him than what we see. But be of good cheer, not because of me, not because of elder, not because of my deacons. He says, be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Your Lord and Savior has overcome the world. Beloved, each and every Christian is born of God. Can somebody say amen? And therefore, according to the word of God, somebody say amen. amen. We too have overcome the world. Will you dare to believe that truth? Will you dare to believe that truth? And it all happens because of our faith. God has declared that Christ has overcome the world. God has declared that Christians have overcome the world. Amen. The overcome of this, overcome this spiritually upside down world. And if there ever been a day and an age where we should know this world is upside down, it's today. The spiritually upside down world does not mean that we're empowered to turn everything in this world right side up. That's not the goal. Instead, no. Instead, it means that we have the power. Somebody say power. So we have the power. Somebody say power. So we have the power. Somebody say power. The power to stand with God and the power to stand for God in spite of what the world brings against us. So you stand for right when everybody else wants to do wrong. You go the right way, even if going the right way means you got to stand by yourself sometimes. Because what you'll understand is when you may feel you're most lonely, you are never alone, child of God. Because the Spirit of God is supposed to dwell inside of you. So you ain't never alone. Don't believe that lie, that trick of the devil. You are never alone. Therefore, by the faith of God, we should never allow anything to try to separate us from the love of God. That is only revealed in how we love those who God loves. And therefore, we should love each other. We should love each other. Touch your neighbor right now and say, neighbor, you should love me. Some of y'all looking at each other like, Now, I didn't say, say, neighbor, you do love me. <laughs> so you, 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 you can make that statement without any consequence. You should love me. You should love me. You should love me. Therefore, instead, but instead of loving each other, we can retreat into our own personal places and spaces where we forsake transformation for comfort and conformity. That's what a lot of us do. We want to be comfortable. And in being comfortable, we would rather conform than to be transformed. Beloved, understand, Jesus said, I didn't come to make you comfortable. So if you're sitting up in your, your house, be it the place where you dwell or be your house of worship, and you're good and comfortable, I'm good and comfortable. I'm, I'm not going to do anything any different ever again. That's not the way of God. That is not the way of God. And it's somebody who you need to be loving on who needs to see a better you than that. You see, instead of loving each other, we can overlook the evil in the world and decide that we cannot make a difference. If we can't make a difference, who can? Beloved, instead of loving each other, we can believe that art imitates life and that life imitates art and seek to commercialize some of the madness that we should be trying to conquer. Right now, you look on the TV, you look on the internet, you listen to the radio, and there's so much mess that we can look at it and know it's not right. And people trying to use what's not right to sell you on some stuff. And plant it in your mind, your heart, and your spirit, and that of your children, stuff that you know is not right. But they try to make it like, well, everybody's doing it. Everybody's not doing it. That's a lie. But if I can get you to buy into it and to buy it, then you will. You see, beloved, instead of loving each other, we can seek to entertain ourselves with pleasures of creation and neglect the life of obedience that we owe to the creator. That we should be giving to God. 
And instead of loving each other, we can tell every man or woman to do the best they can, while they can, with what they can, depending on luck and some predetermined mix of time, talent, and treasure. Instead of trusting God. Or, somebody say or. or. We can do something else. We can love each other the way that God loves us. By recognizing that God gave us life. That God gave us eternal life. And that end of the time in between is ours to demonstrate our love for God. By loving each other the way that God loves us. We could do that instead. 1991, the hip-hop group, Black Sheep, had a song called The Choice Is Yours. So you can get with this or you can get with that. You can get with this or you can get with that. You can get with this or you can get with that. I think you get with this because this is where it's at. You can get with this or you can get with that. You can get with this or you can get with that. You can get with this or you can get with that. I think you get with this because this is kind of fat. Now, beloved, in 1991, I was graduating from Morehouse College in Georgia Tech. And fat was urban slang for highly attractive, gratifying, or excellent. I think you should get with the Love Chronicle. God wants you to know that the Love Chronicles are kind of fat, are highly attractive, gratifying, and excellent. I think you should get with Love God the Son. God wants you to know that loving God the Son is kind of fat, highly attractive, gratifying, and excellent. I think you should get with loving God the Father. God wants you to know that loving God the Father is kind of fat, a highly attractive, gratifying, and excellent. And I think you should get with loving God the Holy Spirit because loving God the Holy Spirit, according to God, is kind of fat. That's highly attractive, uh, gratifying, and excellent. And I think you should get with loving each other. God wants you to know that the body of Christ, we are kind of fat. We are highly attractive. We are gratifying and we are excellent. Why? Because God is love and everyone who loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God for God is love. So, beloved, let us love one another. So, our journey through the Love Chronicles has come to an end. Or has it? You see, beloved, in truth, love is a never ending story. Just as the Holy Bible, God's sacred word, is a never ending story story. It was birthed in eternity to lead us to eternity. As God never ends, love never ends. Never ends. So beloved, may you love God and may you love each other as God would have you to love. Love is part of of a never-ending story. Amen. Amen.